All right, good evening, everyone. How are you tonight? Good? Thanks for coming. Thank you all for being here tonight at the University of St. Thomas. I'm Victoria Young, Chair of the Art History Department. And I just wanted to, once again, thank you for coming on a Friday night, a beautiful Friday night in this lovely fall that we're in. And I'm very pleased to have you here because so many people in our program work really hard to make events like this happen. This is the first talk in our annual speaker series. Every year, the Department of Art History puts together a series based on a theme. And this year, it's contemplation and art. And a lot of people come together to find these speakers, to do our graduate student symposium tomorrow. Where are our grad students from afar? Will you all raise your hand who are here for that? Yay, thank you for coming. It's great to have you. We'll look forward to your talks tomorrow. And this goes together, too, with the exhibitions that we host. So you can take a look at the exhibition that's right out in the lobby here tonight during our reception. But it's been really fun for our department to come together and bring this scholarship to campus for our students. Because as you know, being in the classroom is fabulous. But being a part of a bigger art historical community is, is, is a necessity, is a necessity, really. So I'm very pleased to have you here tonight. And I want to introduce to you Dr. Craig Eliason. Um, Dr. Eliason, along with Dr. Heather Shirey, our Director of Graduate Studies, are the co-chairs of our speaker series and events this weekend, and they have done a fabulous job, along with Maria Thompson, our Graduate Program Manager, who brings everything to life. So please join me in doctoring, in doctoring, hello, <laughs> in welcoming Dr. Craig Eliason. Thank you. Uh, just to echo uh, what's just been said, the speaker series is such a terrific opportunity to bring scholarship to uh, to campus, and I couldn't be happier uh, to be in the position to introduce our lead-off speaker for uh, this year's series that's uh, on contemplation and art, and that's Dr. Walter Millian. Dr. Millian is the Asa Griggs Candler Professor and Chair of Art History at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia and uh, formerly professor and chair at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. Dr. Melian has been at Emory since 2004. He's published extensively on Dutch and Flemish art and art theory of the 16th and 17th centuries, on Jesuit image theory, on the relation between theology and aesthetics in the early modern period, and on the artist Hendrik Gultius. He has an uh, amazing number of books on his resume, uh, including the Meditative Art Studies in the Northern Devotional Print, 1550 to 1625, which was published in 2009. And he also has a very uh, impressively long list of co-edited uh, books that have been well received, uh, including Ut Pictura Meditatio, The Meditative Image in Northern Art, 1500 to 1700. He was elected foreign member of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2010. Between 2014 and 2015, he was Cher Fanqui at the Université Catholique de Louvain and the Catholique Universiteit Louvain. Dr. Melian is the recipient of the 2016 Distinguished Scholar Award from the American Catholic Historical Association. Uh, this is just a partial list of our speaker's accomplishments and accolades, uh, but you're here not to hear me talk about him, but to hear from him, uh, which I'm as excited as you to do. So without further delay, uh, join me in welcoming to the stage Dr. Walter Mellon. Thank you very much, Craig, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to be here and to meet uh, the faculty in this spectacular department. It's really just such a marvelous department. And uh, earlier today, I was at a chance to visit the uh, thriving collection of uh, religious imagery, and that is simply one of the best old master print collections I have ever seen. And it also has the best Blumat drawing in North America. I didn't even know it was here. So I've had a wonderful day. OK, let's talk about uh, Peter Bruegel. Engraved by Philip Schaller after Peter Bruegel, the resurrection of circa 1562 to 1563 explores a problem central to the exegetical tradition, namely that this great mystery of faith as set forth in the Gospels and Epistles, was witnessed by no one and must thus be known solely by means of the prophecies it fulfilled and the evidentiary signs left in its wake. Published by Hieronymus Koch, who perhaps also commissioned the drawing in pen, 
brown ink and wash, and almost surely retained possession of the large copper plate, the resurrection emulates the huge print of the same subject, etched and engraved by Jan and Lucas van Duticum after Franz Floris, and issued by Koch about five years earlier in 1557. It is he, more than likely, who orchestrated this emulative exercise involving two of the best known masters in the Low Countries, who epitomized two modes of picturing, the one Latinate and Italianate, largely based on the antique, the other Demotic, based on local pictorial tradition, more specifically on Burgundian masters, such as Rochir van der Weyden. Bruchel must have designed his version to be seen in tandem with Floris's. The composition, as reversed by Haller, closely corresponds to that in the print by the Fenduticums. However, equally pronounced are the differences between their conceptions of this great mystery. Most importantly, Floris's resurrection closely attaches to the pictorial tradition, unlike Bruegel's which incorporates novel features taken from canonical patristic exegeses of Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, and John 20, as codified in the Glossa Ordinaria et Interlinearis and the Postilae of Nicholas of Lyra, and then paraphrased in Erasmus's immensely popular paraphrasis on the four gospels written between 1522 and 1523, and issued by the Frogan Press, both singly and in revised editions comprising all the paraphrases. Floris conflates the events chronicled in Matthew 28, verses two to four. The arrival of an angel descended from heaven who rolls back the stone and whose flashing countenance and brilliant raiment so overwhelm the gods that struck with terror, they become as dead men. With the resurrection proper, making it seem as if Jesus is raised up by angels rather than by the power of God inherent in Christ himself. In a glaring anachronism, what Matthew described as occurring after the fact is instead seen as coincident with the mystery that came before. The soldier thrown off balance by this wondrous sight who tries to shield his eyes from the blinding refulgence of the risen Christ makes it seem as if by the simple expedient of shifting his raised arm, he could witness the coming forth of Christus Redivivus in contravention of the gospel account. The three holy women visible in the middle distance at right, presumably Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Mary Salome, who arrived, according to Matthew, after the resurrection, at or just after the appearance of the angel whose apparitio stunned the gods, implicitly identify the event taking place in the foreground as earlier, the very moment of resurrection, which actually took place before their arrival. In fact, the liberties taken by Floris are exceptions that prove the rule, as becomes evident from other prints of the resurrection. The much copied version of 1569 by Cornelis Floris, I sorry, Cornelis Court, after Giulio Clovio, for instance, shows the soldiers reacting violently to the presence of Christ, whose sudden appearance causes them to start back and seize their weapons. If the prominent soldier shielding his eyes, like his counterpart in the Fanduticum print, suggests ambiguously that the resurrection is, one and, is at one and the same time seen and yet not seen, the other soldiers, the seated one looking up at right and the startled one at left, recoiling and yet transfixed, invite us to infer that they are eyewitnesses. Other versions published by Phillips Haller likewise imply that the resurrection was witnessed. The oblong resurrection after Jan van der Straat inscribed 
When the third day dawned, newly risen, the victor returned to life in solemn triumph, death having been laid low, the innocent victim by his slaughter having appeased the father, intimates that Christ returned to life before the very eyes of the gods, whom his conquest over death laid low. This print forms part of the series, Passion, Death, and Resurrection of Our Lord Jesus Christ, produced circa 1580, that purports to illustrate the life of Christ as recounted in the Gospels. Like the other versions cited above, Thunderstrats views, Thunderstrats views the resurrection through the lens of John 18, verse 6, when Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane reveals to the soldiers and servants of the chief priests and the Pharisees that his, he is Jesus of Nazareth, they are thrown backward and fall to the ground. And so there's this, uh, in the pictorial tradition, what happens is that event becomes conflated with the imagery of the resurrection. And even though this print series purports closely to follow the scriptural account, it in fact diverges from it and is instead situated in the pictorial tradition. Bruchel eschews these liberties taken with the scriptural reports of the events corollary to the resurrection by which it comes to be promulgated. He cleaves closely throughout to scripture. The group of five women, to start with, are a harmonization of Mark 16, which, as previously noted, identifies Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Mary Salome as present. And John 24, quote, and it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary of James and the other women that were with them. He relies on Matthew 28, verses 1 to 10, for the main details of the scene. The angel sitting upon the stone, he has rolled back, his countenance like lightning, his raiment white as snow, who admonishes the women, fear not you. One of them has caught sight of the angel and responds accordingly her hands folded in prayer. Her companion, as yet unaware of the angel, gestures in surprise, enacting Mark 16, verse 4, and looking, they saw the stone rolled back. Bruchel has divided the image into two episodes, to the right and left of the vertical axis defined by the angel, that correspond respectively to Matthew 28, verses 5 to 7, the arrival of the women and their exchange with the angel, and Matthew 28, verse 11, the reaction of the soldiers after their initial shock has subsided. According to Matthew, some of them eventually departed to tell the chief priests all things that had been done, which is to say that they closely observed and remembered what had transpired. Bruchel takes great care to show them responding to the traces of the angel. One kneels to inspect the massive stone, conferring with the guardsmen beside him. Two others peer down into the rock-cut tomb, and one of them extends an open hand to signal that the chamber is empty. Crucially, no one responds straightway to the risen Christ, who floats high above the women and the soldiers, his glorious presence occluded by enveloping clouds. To emphasize that Christ, present and yet unseen, is knowable only by means of mediating endicia. That's I-N-D-I-C-I-A, endicia. It signifies signs. Bruchel has him point toward the rising sun in a rhetorical gesture that impels us to recognize it as a visual analog to the resurrection. The guardsman, seated on sheaves of straw at lower right, who stares in the direction of the women and the dawning light, his arm raised to shield his eyes, differs from his counterpart in Flores's resurrection, for he beholds not the resplendent savior, but rather his solar proxy. He may also be reacting to the light of the angel, whose brightness was seen by the soldiers, according to Matthew 28, verse 4. The viewer's vantage point 
exactly correlates to another indicium, or better, argumentum, that is evidentiary proof or token. So an argumentum is an evidentiary proof or token. The unbroken seal, situated at mid-height, once one can either look down with the soldiers or up with the women, following their lines of sight as they scan for evidentiae resurrectionis, evidence of the resurrection, the corroborating marks by which the resurrection may be discerned. This is the seal affixed by the chief priests and the Pharisees to prevent Christ's followers from stealing away his body and falsely claiming that his prophecy, after three days I will rise again, has come true. It serves oppositely and ironically to license the truth of the mystery fulfilled. Moreover, Brujo, or perhaps more precisely, Kala, also comment metapictorially on his ability to offer a visual warrant for the resurrection. The picture is a picture of a framed picture. And as such, this image, qua image, aligns with other patently visual signs of the mystery that must be known at second hand by faith in the veridical signs left in its wake. And, and the point I'm making it has to do with um, something that is slightly cropped in this otherwise beautiful image from the British Museum. And you can see that there is a frame that around the image. And that emphasizes that we're looking at a pictorial image. The resurrection in these and other ways emphasizes that vision and image are divinely licensed instruments of faith. Bruegel's image in the arguments it puts forth about the evidentiae resurrectionis breaks with pictorial convention in order directly to engage with the exegetical tradition. And in that respect forms part of a series of meditative images by Coltius, which are exegetical in form and function. As this paper develops, you'll see what I mean by this. Like his contemporary Grisai, Christ and the Woman Taken in Adultery of 1565, the resurrection constitutes the visual exegesis of a scriptural crux closely examined in the glossa and other exegetical compendia, and as such, undoubtedly familiar to biblically literate associates of Brujo, not least the Koch, Kala, Abraham Ortelius, amongst others. How are such mysteries as the resurrection made discernible to human minds and hearts as matters of belief. Bruchel's print consistently adheres to the arguments of these textual comparanda. The comparanda derived for the most part from the fathers, whose authoritative readings came to be supplemented in 16th century editions of the Glossa with other patristic citations taken from handy compilations such as Thomas of Aquinas's Catena Aurea. And when I arrived, I initially asked Craig, now, University of St. Thomas, which Thomas is that? Is it Thomas the Apostle? Is it Thomas Aquinas? Is it Thomas of Canterbury? And he said, oh, it's Thomas Aquinas. And I said, oh, drat, I cut the Thomas Aquinas section for my paper. <laughs> That's life. The Glossa provides a warrant for the emphasis placed on visible signs of the resurrection. The glosses on Mark 16, for example, largely dwell on the question of sign and why Christ relied on them to communicate the resurrection. The women were highly sensitive to indicia, implies the glosses, on the basis of Mark 15, verse 47, quote, and Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, beheld where he was laid because wishing to pay homage to the Lord's body, they were predisposed accurately to observe, as Victor Antiochinus states, the location and circumstances of his entombment. And this is very typical of the way the Glossa expounds the scriptural accounts of the resurrection. 
uh, instead of discussing the resurrection directly, it focuses on the question of what were the evidence of it, what were the signs of it that convinced people it had occurred, taught people that it had occurred. Indeed, as Bede avers, they were, quote, humble souls, these are the women, who diligently devoted themselves to the relics of his passion, burning more fervently with love of the Savior as their awareness of his human frailty grew apace. So these women are very sensitive to indicia of the resurrection because they were highly alert to the relics of the passion. The pious curiosity, pia curiositate, the pious curiosity that animates their desire to imitate Christ as evinced in Mark 15 provides the backdrop to their privilege of learning from the vestigia resurrectionis, the vestiges of the resurrection in Mark 16, even though as commentators such as Severianos and Theophilactus have noted, they lacked faith in the resurrection and initially failed to recognize the quote, magnitude and dignity of Christ's divinity. And what I'm doing here is paraphrasing the glossa for, uh, paraphrasing the glossa for you. And it's very important that the glossa says they had no faith in the resurrection. They had no conception of what the resurrection might be. And they certainly didn't believe in the possibility of the resurrection. They were persuaded gradually by the sheer quantity of signs, indices, vestiges left distributed by Christ to make apparent that he had indeed risen. Deficient faith as the tropological gloss to a later episode in Mark 16, the appearance of Christ to two pilgrims journeying through the countryside, this is often called the journey to Emmaus, declares, is the primary reason why Christ chose to reveal the resurrection to his disciples indirectly, not openly. The, the Latin, for those of you who have, I mean, it's the University of St. Thomas, so I'm assuming you are fluent in Latin, but the, 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 I can't assume that almost anywhere else anymore, but the Latin goes, veritas non revelatur aperte, so it was not openly revealed, but through mediating instruments, signs, indices, vestiges, etc. Overcome by the fear of death, as an interlinear gloss opines, the women were incapable of discerning this life-affirming fact, if not by way of the image of the resurrection, the formam resurrectionis, the image of the resurrection, bodied forth by the bright angel they encountered within the tomb, which is to say that the glossa construes the angel itself as an image and in that sense a sign of the resurrection. It is another indicium of the mystery. The etymology of the term tomb, monumentum, tomb, as Nicholas of Lyra specifies, contains an allusion to the mediating function of all such signs, which are divinely designed, quote, to move the mind and heart. That's what a sign does. It moves the mind and heart. Okay, this is the false but very clever etymology, moens mentem moving the mind, moens mentem, hence monu mentem. See, it's a false, false etymology, but it's beautifully constructed. Moens mentem becomes monumentum, compelling them to believe what in other respects might appear impossible or implausible. Like the glory of the opened sepulcher, they are dispensed as prompts, preliminaries to a fuller opening of eyes and hearts, that would otherwise remain spiritually shuttered. Now, um, implicit in my argument is that the sustained attention to signs of the resurrection is a kind of spiritual exercise, and it is a meditative spiritual exercise set by Christ. And in effect, your close attention to Bruegel's version of the resurrection is a kind of imitation of the close attentiveness to visual signs and indices of the resurrection through which Christ's original followers came to believe that it had indeed transpired. And so their response to these signs is in parallel to your meditative engagement 
or to use the terminology of the symposium and the lecture series, contemplative engagement. And in my comments tomorrow on what I thought were eight splendid graduate student papers, I, I, I'm going to call attention to the distinction uh, in early modern usage between meditation and contemplation. And one of the papers actually also makes this, uh, this point. Elsewhere, in the comments on Mark 16, the glosser formulates a general defense of argumenta as prima facie evidence of the resurrection. First, they prove useful because of their adaptability to contingencies of every kind. Christ utilizes them to accommodate various human capabilities. The women, for instance, are given to see a radiant youth because this, they see the angel and they think the angel is a radiant youth because this image, this visionem, conforms to their feebleness and simplicity of faith. Quote, for they were such fit to see neither the savior nor the angel ablaze like lightning, or the two angels sitting within the tomb, or the two men standing at hand, as Luke narrates, close quote. On this account, signs are divinely adapted to human psychology, and as such, abide by the rhetorical rule of decorum. So match your speech to the capabilities of your audience, what I hope, sincerely, I'm doing here right now. Bruegel's effort to show a wide range of reaction to the argumenta resurrectionis speaks to this notion of semiotic malleability. Second, the signs that give evidence of the resurrection are to be construed as a subset of the many kinds and degrees of divinely sanctioned images by which we glimpse God in this life while awaiting the beatific vision securely to be granted facia ad faciem, face to face, in the life to come. They are like specular images that adumbrate and stand proxy for the fuller vision of God that shall one day follow. The Glossist's image theory, which turns on the dual analogy of argumenta to images, and of the vision of God to the resurrection constitutes a reading of Mark 16, verse 12. Quote, and after that he appeared in another form, in alia effigio, in another form, the two of them walking as they were going into the countryside. The phrase in alia effigio, in another form, another shape, another image, is interpreted as a warrant for all the image-based argumenta that serve to transmit knowledge of the resurrection to human eyes, hearts, and minds. Quote, here an eager faith enacts the active life. There, by contemplative vision, a secure faith reigns. Here we see a mirrored image. There we shall see the truth face to face. Wherefore, he showed himself in another form to those two who were walking afterwards in the countryside. Close quote. The argumenta are like the image used by Christ to defer knowledge of himself until these two disciples, their doubtful faith short up, had shown themselves worthy of recognizing him more directly. And this image is a species of the imagines, the other images that shall continue to encode and defer the vision of God until we are beatified and able to see with spiritual eyes, thus argues the glossist. As Nicholas of Lyra trenchantly remarks, and I should just explain that, that the glossa consists of hundreds, if not thousands, of excerpts from the church fathers. And then in the uh, 14th century, um, Nicholas of Lyra added additional glosses to the original glosses. So it's a fascinating text. It's glosses on glosses and glosses and glosses. As Nicholas of Lyra trenchantly remarks, the argumenta are therefore evidentiary in a double sense. They allude not only to the risen Christ, but also to the condition of the human hearts in which he dwells only partially, faith in the resurrection having still not arisen. 
quote, and because they were doubtful in faith, Christ for this reason appeared to them in another form, thereby to signify in what sort he dwelt within their heart. But some say this was done through some sort of change in the face of Christ, such as at the transfiguration. Others say that the change took place only in the eyes of the beholders. And this view accords with what is said about the apparition in Luke 24, verse 16. But their eyes were held that they should not know him. Howsoever, there was no falsehood in what was done. For just as something can be fashioned in words, and so too in deeds, but the former without falsehood, as becomes evident in the parables of the New and Old Testaments, wherein something suitable to signifying some truth is fashioned in words, so also in the same manner Christ here affected to appear in an image. The argumenta are likened to the effigies, the effigies put forth by Christ, and again to his parabolic images that represent truths as incontrovertibly as the deeds these images analogize. As parabola rendered in verbis, in words, so argumenta are rendered in effigiebus, in images that harken back to the facts and doctrine, the facta and doctrina bodied forth by Christ. Bruchel adverts to the relation between fact and sign, factum and signum, by depicting the angel in pose, gesture, and facial expression as an epigony, or better, emanation of Christ. Even the angel's robe is likened to the billowing drapery of Christ. That the angel sits rather than floating upward, and his robe hangs down rather than fluttering in midair, indicates that signs, even when they cleave closely to the divine truths they represent, operate within the mimetic constraints of the terrestrial sphere. The same can be said of the angel's aureole that emits a lesser, more circumscribed light than the far more expansive refulgence of Christ. The status of the argumenta resurrectionis as veridical images is underscored by the holoprint's elaborate frame which since insists on the pictorial standing of the resurrection, thus stressing that the arguments, the argumenta it adduces, are bound up with a discourse of images. Bruchel's conception of the resurrection can be seen to correspond to a mosaic type for the mode of the mystery's transmission, as adduced by the glosses in his reading of Mark 16, verse 12. He appeared in another shape to the two of them walking as they were going into the country. Specifically of the phrase, ostensus est in alia effigio. So he was shown, he appeared in another form, in another shape, in another image. Just as Moses complains in Exodus 33 that the Lord has thus far concealed his glory, allowing neither his minister nor his chosen people directly to know him. So the two travelers who lament the death of Christ are prevented by him from discerning the glory of his risen body. Moses asks God to grant the favor of showing his face. In response, God promises to walk with his people, showing them all good. But he withholds the splendor of his face. Quote, thou canst not see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And I will take away my hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face thou canst not see. The glossa draws a parallel between this exchange and the appearance of Christ to his disciples ex argumentis, from arguments. Bruchel's radiant Christ, his face, indeed his whole person, imperceptible, to the people below functions as a veritable antitype to the mosaic type invoked by the glosses. It is as if Bruchel composed his scene with the type in mind. 
correlating the resurrection to its primary elements in order to invoke a precedent for the risen Christ strategy of forestalling his self-revelatory apparitionis, appearances. Like God the Father, he shows all good, disseminating signs of his presence even while concealing himself. The removal of Christ in Bruegel's resurrection, his position high above and apart from the women and the soldiers, answers to the Glossa's portrayal of him as situated beyond the realm of human apprehension, whence his presence may be deduced, in, deduced from indexical relics of the mystery. The Glossa, in its reading of Luke 24, and especially verses 13 to 33, on the journey to Emmaus, provides an elaborate justification of divinely sanctioned senia signs, argumenta, evidentiary proofs, and documenta, documentary proofs. The terms are used almost interchangeably to drive home the point that such signs are invaluable as verifying instruments. In a very specific sense, they function like scriptural types, scriptural tipi, figural types, that require exegetical unveiling, or more precisely, decoding, if they are properly to be understood. The glossist makes this clear by comparing the stone rolled back from the sepulcher to the veil of the letter of the law that covered over the sacred mysteries of Christ under the old dispensation. The opening of the sepulcher signifies the revelation of these mysteries by Christ, whose resurrection initially withheld from human eyes, then conferred, confirmed gradually by representational signs, and at last disclosed incontrovertibly through the bodily and spiritual agency of Christ himself in his appearances after the resurrection, licenses in the way it comes to be known, the translation of referential types into fully discernible antitypes of partial into full-fledged images, whose coming forth in acts the revelation of the sacred things of Christ. Quote, the rolling back of the stone signifies the revelation of the sacred mysteries of Christ that were covered over by the veil of the letter. The law was written in stone. Upon removal of the law's integument, the Lord's dead body was nowhere to be found, but instead his living body was preached evangelically, for even though we knew Christ according to the flesh, we now know him no longer in this way. Close quote. We instead know him according to the glorified body he finally showed to his disciples, having prepared them to receive it by way of various mediating images that proved beneficial not only to them but to the whole church. Quote, that the disciples were slow to believe in the resurrection speaks not so much to their infirmity as to our future firmness of faith. For the resurrection was revealed to those doubters by virtue of many evidentiary proofs, multis argumentis, through which, provided that we read and understand them, we are as if fortified by their doubt, which is to say fortified by all of these signs, all of these evidentiary proofs through which they came to know the mystery of the resurrection. The fundamental analogy between reading senia, reading signs, and reading scripture, which is to say between reading images and reading scripture, between discerning signs and exegetical unfolding, derives from the content of Luke 24, verses 27 to 31, in which exposition of the scriptures concerning Christ predisposes Cleophas and his companion, often identified as Luke himself, finally to recognize him at table when he breaks, blesses, and distributes bread. And what I'm arguing here is in that reading, 
of Luke 24 exegesis, so the interpretation of scriptures by Christ, is construed as a form of evidentiary proof, as a sign itself, as an image. And so what the glossa, which is a great exegetical commentary on scripture, is doing is arguing that exegeses are, in fact, images. And I was talking earlier with, with uh, Joanna about a certain resistance in the, amongst theologians and religious historians, but an ever-shrinking group of theologians and, and, and religious historians, to the notion that images can function exegetically in the 16th and 17th centuries. And the way in which the glossa reads exegesis as equivalent to signs and images is, I think, an exegetical proof of the exegetical function of images. Uh, the opening of their eyes in Luke 24, verse 31, completes the process initiated by exhaustive exegesis of the prophecies foretelling him. Taking his cue from this sequence, the glossist applies the term legente, reading, to the signs propounded as traces of the resurrection and as earnest of what shall retrospectively be believed and understood about it. And so the term that the glossa uses interchangeably with seeing these signs is reading these signs. Following from the glosses on Mar Matthew 28 and Mark 16, the glossist, along with Nicholas of Lyra, here contends that the signs at issue, the sunya at issue, are in fact ephetias, their images. He does this in several ways. First, he frequently states that the signs of the resurrection, even when accompanied by words, were primarily visual in form and function. For example, he says about the two men who suddenly appeared in shining apparel, that in announcing the glory of Christ triumphant, they impressed as much, if not more, by their radiant garments as by their words. Second, the senior resurrections, the signs of the resurrection, are occasionally treated as themselves a subset of the appearances, the apparitions of Christ. Nicholas of Lyra, to cite one instance, when he parses how the resurrection was described by stages to Christ's followers, refers to the two men's appearance and announcement as the apparition of Christ delivered to the women. So that presentation of, of, of signs is itself construed as an appearance of Christ, thus alighting apparitio into description, descriptio. The effect is to stress the visual nature of the signs conveyed as images of the resurrection and as anticipatory to the appearances of Christ soon to follow. Third, even when Christ revealed, actually, not virtually, his glorious and divinized body, as when he is at last seen and known by Cleophas and his companion just before vanishing, the glossist emphasizes that the appearance consists of an image, a specius, an image, a likeness, more specifically, a theatricalized image, a staged, an enacted image. It is by withdrawing the image of human mortality, the specius infirmitatis, the image of human mortality from their eyes, and showing, and then not showing his visible body, that Christ makes his glorious resurrection apparent to their hearts and minds. Quote, the image of infirmity was subtracted from their carnal eyes in order that the glory of the resurrection might begin to appear within their hearts, within their minds. Nicholas of Lyra argues even more explicitly that what Christ showed to the disciples at Emmaus when their eyes were opened was an image of himself in a form recognizable to them. Quote, for he voluntarily showed himself to them in the form of an image by which he became recognizable to them and through which they came to know him in the breaking of the bread. These visible signs of the resurrection, 
are presented as fully consistent with the apparition of Christ bodily and spiritually to the 11 fearful disciples gathered in Jerusalem. The Glossist situates this event within the sequence of prior documenta that have given evidence of the resurrection. Quote, he persuades by many demonstrable proofs of the resurrection, showing himself as visible to the eyes, as palpable to the hands, and in disclosing that his bones and flesh may be touched, he signifies the nature of our resurrection to come, when our bodies shall be subtle by the effect of spiritual potency and simultaneously palpable according to the truth of nature, close quote. This documentum, the Glossist implies, differs in degree, not kind, from its predecessors. For Christ exhibits himself to be seen by the eyes and as a further proof touched by the hands, thus showing that he has risen palpably, both in body and in spirit. He is merely adding another layer of proof to the many signs, indices, and arguments already dispensed. To mark this point, the Glossist, in a close reading of Luke 24, verse 40, and when he had said this, he showed his hands and feet, dwells at length on his visible wounds, treating them like a felt image of suffering undergone and overcome, the effects of which are both potent and multifarious. They build faith in the resurrection, secure the mercy of God by showing what manner of death he patiently endured, expose to view as visible signs the mercy bestowed by his death on all who would be saved, and justify the damnation of sinners whose sins are revealed as the cause of these stripes. The wounded body of Christ is scanned, its telling scars scrutinized, as if it were a visual image, a surface comprising many signs, marks, tokens, and proofs of his redemptive labor now gloriously confirmed by the mystery of the resurrection. In turn, this bodily image is conjoined once again to an exegetical exercise, as the glossist observes, quote, after sight, after contact, after recollection of the law, he opened sense, giving them to understand what they saw and read. Now, the notion that the signs of the resurrection of Christ are like effigies and images, effigies and specias, that must be read in the manner of scriptural types and prophecies, correlates to Bruchel's emphasis on senia and the reactions they elicit from variously responsive and unresponsive witnesses in his unconventional but scripturally sound rendition of the resurrection. The angel who gestures toward the seal, stone, and empty tomb with one hand, urging the women to take note, and imitates the gesture of the invisibly risen Christ with the other hand, showing himself to be his visible emanation, bodies forth the glossist's argument that senia are a species of appearance continuous with the presence of Christ, or more precisely, with his action of making himself present to human sense. The axially central position of the seal, still affixed to the stone, brightly conspicuous against the tomb's shadowy interior, brings to mind the trope of the stone removed that analogizes the meaning of the resurrection to the uncovering of the integument of the law. Like the glossist, Bruegel seems to have formulated an elaborate defense of divinely sanctioned signs, arguments, and documents, showing how they substitute for an event, the resurrection, not witnessed, and for a sight, the risen Christ, as yet unseen. He thereby implicitly justifies his own picture, its status as image made doubly apparent in the print by the eternal frame. Erasmus's popular paraphrases on the Gospels amplify the synoptic and Johannine accounts of the resurrection 
greatly accentuated the thematic of visual proof. They furnish another discursive lens, complementary to the glossa, through which Bruegel's resurrection may be viewed. And so now I'm going to turn to Erasmus in the closing section of my paper. And, and you probably are familiar with a, what a paraphrasis is. It's a very specific Latin term. A paraphrasis is a descriptive elaboration of another text. And so what Erasmus does in the paraphrasis is, in effect, to rewrite the gospel far more descriptively than the scriptural account. And Erasmus does this through the rec rhetoric of image making. And so he uses every conceivable rhetorical figure through which verbally he can produce visual images. Erasmus proposes that Christ revealed the truth of the resurrection indirectly by means of argumenta in order that his disciples should rise to the challenge of knowing this great mystery through the application of their human faculties, both sensory and cognitive. He strongly implies that the activation of these faculties is constitutive of the very act of faith that cognition and sense, especially the sense of sight, set in motion. Throughout the paraphrases, especially the paraphrase on the Gospel of Matthew, Erasmus uses the term faith, fides, faith, in its dual meaning of faith and piece of evidence or better evidentiary proof. And, and Erasmus, who of course was very aware of, of the glossa and understood its very elaborate argument about signs, indices, documents, then paraphrases this argument. And what he does is he puns on the Latin term for faith, fides, because in Erasmus's usage, fides signifies not only faith, but piece of evidence, evidentiary proof. The resurrection is thus presented as a mystery of faith that requires the faithful to engage in the process of reading divinely promulgated proofs. Typical of this usage is his description of the vigil kept at the tomb by Mary Magdalene and the other Mary on the evening of the Lord's burial. They were searching, he contends, for evidence of the resurrection. Quote, Indeed, after the rest had gone away, two women continued to remain there, Mary Magdalene and one other, sitting opposite the tomb, and noting the place where they buried the body so that at their own time they might perform the duty of anointing it. The Lord had incited the zealous vigilance of these women so that the evidence of faith in, that pun on fides, evidence of faith in the resurrection, would be made more certain, close quote. This reading of Fides is an elaboration of Matthew 27, verse 61, which tersely states, and there was there Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulcher. So that's all you get in scripture, and you can see how much more elaborate and also how much more visual Erasmus's expansion upon the scriptural, scriptural text is, his paraphrasis. Erasmus similarly augments Matthew 27, verses 62 to 66, stating, as had Jerome in the commentary on Matthew, that the efforts of the chief priests and Pharisees to prevent removal of the body served instead to give further evidence of the resurrection. Quote, and while they were trying to block up the exit for the one who was going to rise again, they enhanced the miracle and the evidence of faith in the resurrection. Erasmus also amplifies Matthew 28, verse 6, the angel's invitation, come and see the place where the Lord was laid. In answering his description of indexical visibilia, visible signs, visible things, the angel defers to sight seen over his own words, averring that the former have a greater power to convince. Quote, so this is what the angel says, according to Erasmus. Come and see the place that still shows the imprint of a body, though no body is here, and the clothing of the body, the linens in which it was wrapped. These things will convince you if you do not believe my words. Close quote. 
Matthew 28, verse 8, mentions only that the women went out quickly from the sepulcher. But Erasmus adds that they actually inspected it after ascertaining that it had formerly been closed. And he prefaces the paraphrasis of Matthew 28 by noting that the women in visiting the sepulcher were motivated by their desire to see what had transpired. That is, to pay heed to the traces of events already come to pass. When Christ appears to them at first hand, as they hasten back to Jerusalem, he does so to certify the things they have seen, making their testimony incontrovertible. Erasmus also imagines the gods recounting to the chief priests what they had witnessed, thereby bringing evidence of the resurrection manifestly into view. Quote, then some of the gods left the sepulcher, went to Jerusalem, and reported to the chief priests what had taken place. This was done so that confidence in the resurrection might be strengthened even by the testimony of enemies. The gods told how, although the sepulcher had been closed and sealed, the body had not been found, how an angel of wondrous aspect moved the stone. They spoke about the earthquake and how they had been paralyzed with fear, also how they had heard the angel speaking with the women, since the matter was too evident to be doubted. In other words, since there was too much evidence to doubt, the chief priests bribed the gods with an offer of money to lie. Even after appearing to the disciples assembled on the mountain in Galilee, Christ continues to disseminate indubitable proofs of the resurrection, shoring up their faith, providing further evidence, converting doubt into certitude. He situates these visible proofs amongst other images of himself that the disciples are enjoyed, enjoined to call up when they preach the gospel. You have seen me through the weakness of the flesh, hungry, thirsty, weary, needy, despised, arrested, bound, spat upon, condemned, struck, crucified, covered with every sort of abuse, and in some way made lower than the most lowly of human beings. Teach them what they ought to believe about me, what they ought to hope for from me. Though innocent, he suffered for the sins of the entire world. He died on the cross, was laid in a sepulcher, then rose on the third day in keeping with the oracles of the prophets. After this, he dwelt with his disciples for many days and with the truth of his resurrection made clear by sure proofs. Certis argumentis, he again ascended into heaven where, as a share of the kingdom and of eternal glory, he sits on the right hand of the Father Almighty. Erasmus makes clear that the argumenta resurrectionis belong amongst or more precisely mediate between the vivid images of his passion and ascension stored in the minds and hearts of the disciples. They are no less evocative of his visible presence than these other mnemonic images that he urges them to cherish. The paraphrase on the Gospel of Luke puts forward an exegetical analog for the signs of the resurrection. Just as Christ during his life signified in words and deeds that he was the Messiah foreseen by the prophets, so he now dispensed signs of the mystery that itself signifies, as well as guarantees the reality of eternal salvation. Indeed, signifying types embodied forth by the prophets and the signs of the resurrection put forth by Christ are seen to coalesce in the prophetic figure of Jonah invoked by Christ in Matthew 12. Crucially for Erasmus, Christ utilizes the phrase signum Jonah, sign of Jonah, to refer to the resurrection. He has Jesus himself argue this point in a very extended paraphrase of Luke 24, verse 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things that were concerning him. As part of his exegetical disquisition addressed to the dis to disciples journeying to Emmaus, Jesus declares, Jonah was swallowed by a whale, and on the third day, contrary to all expectation, he was released from its belly. Christ was buried in the tomb from which
which he promised that he would come forth on the third day. For when the Jews were asking for a sign from heaven, he promised them the sign of the prophet Jonah. And that like Jonah, he would flash forth from the secret places of the earth on the third day. How many times did he impress upon his disciples that he would die and return to life on the third day? The prophet had foretold it. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up. Dubbed Signum Yonai, sign of Jonah, the resurrection is itself understood as a sign, different in degree, not kind, from the various other senia that announce the divinity of the risen Christ. This is a very interesting argument. It diverges from the glossa, um, and he, uh, Erasmus pushes much harder on the notion that the mystery itself is a signum. Conversely, these senior are construed as no less veridical than the events of the passion witnessed by the disciples and just now exegetically expounded by reference to the prefigurings of the law and predictions of the prophets. The senior resurrections, signs of the resurrection, are no less sure than the course of events for both signs and things are subject, as Christ shows, to exegetical confirmation. So when you see that so far everything is completely consistent, the prefigurings of the law, the predictions of the prophets, the prophecies of Christ himself, and finally the actual course of events, how is it that now, as if you were drowsing and dreaming, you are distrustful? How is it that you are not rather drawing conclusions about the future from the past? He foretold that he would be handed over to the Gentiles, bound, flogged, mocked, crucified. Every one of these happened. You saw and you believed. But he foretold that on the third day he would live again and for some days show himself not to the world but to his disciples. Why then do you not trust the women who say that they learned from angels that he had risen, and so on and so forth. Erasmus's paraphrase on the Gospel of John, written between the paraphrases in Matthew and Mark and Luke, examines the psychology of reception that necessitated the use of signs as harbingers of the appearances of Christ, the risen Christ's appearances to the disciples. Forgetful of his prophecies of the resurrection, disciples were initially impervious to these signs and would have been powerless to endure the sight of Christ glorified had he shown himself to them. For this reason, the signs were orchestrated by Jesus gradually to penetrate their eyes, then their minds, and finally their hearts, preparing them to receive him and to recognize that he was, in fact, not the same, his flesh having been divinized, his humanity exalted. Erasmus describes this gradual and sometimes halting process of recognition that leads from various kinds and degrees of indexical signum, indexical sign, to the appearance of Christ himself as Gardner in a form functionally coterminous with the preceding signs that announced and simultaneously veiled his true appearance. These signs and preliminary apparition testify to the mercy of Christ the teacher, who repeatedly adapts his method of instruction to the capacities and limitations of his students. The next steps in the gradual, this ascent towards semiotic legibility are taken by John, Peter, and the Magdalene, who refusing to leave the tomb, continues looking about to see if there might be some glimmer of hope of finding the body. So great is her yearning that she finally peers deep into the tomb, craning her neck to see if she might espy him. The two angels she now descries answer to her intense desire to be reunited with his mortal remains. They are sent, Erasmus tells us, to quicken hope as a prelude to the appearance of Christ himself, whose question to Mary, woman, why are you crying, they pose in anticipation of the exchange soon to follow. Moreover, their manner of beholding exercises hers, realizing from their awestruck 
expressions that someone is standing behind her, she turns and catches sight of Jesus. But still she fails to realize who he is, for he appeared in humble guise, so as not to frighten the woman with the sudden sight of his true appearance. And nor does she prove capable of leveling her gaze. Instead, she turns back and forth from the angels to the man she has misidentified as gardener, caretaker, or watchman, until hearing him call Mary, and prompted by his known and familiar voice, she finally recognizes Jesus, addressing him by his usual title, Rabboni, teacher. The mediating image, the speculus, that makes her ready to discover Christ glorified, showing him as a humble man, is itself a signum signifying the loving care he expends to inculcate the mystery of the resurrection. The progression from signum to speculus, from sign to image, and thence to presentia, to discernible presence, is still incomplete, however, as Erasmus points out. Mary misapprehends Christ thinking that he has returned to life essentially unchanged from who and what he formerly was. And so Jesus forbids her from touching him, thus staging a supplementary signum enacted by Mary herself that, ironically, bodies forth the requisite transition from love of the body, amor corporis, to spiritual fellowship with Christ that every Christian must learn to negotiate. Mary's responses to the senior she comes gradually to discern are inflections of the relation passed in the paraphrases on the Gospels between the evidentiae resurrectionis and the recipients of the indices, arguments, documents, and species in the sense of images constitutive of this visual evidence. Erasmus demonstrates that such signs were originally difficult to read, and they were ordered by Christ into an instructive doctrinal program centering on the mystery of the resurrection, and that they were designed to lead from corporalia, corporal things, to spiritualia, spiritual things. So the paraphrases supply a further layer of discourse against which the particulars of Bruegel's resurrection may be read. The varied reactions of the women, re ranging from inexpectancy to dawning awareness, and the puzzlement of the soldiers evoke Erasmus's argument that the signs of the resurrection were anything but transparent. They had to be noticed, then passed, and finally apprehended, just like Bruegel's image. The distant figures of the two disciples journeying to Emmaus, yes, they really are there. They're barely legible, like teeny, teeny, two teeny figures in the background. In fact, I didn't even believe they were there until I went to the, the copy of the print at the Art Institute of Chicago with a magnifying glass. And yes, they were there, much to my amazement. Correlate to this view of signs, that is the distant figures, the two disciples. They are shown before Jesus, drew near when their knowledge of the resurrection, its prophecies and signs were still dim and shadowy. Bruegel's stepped composition, in which the angel functions as an ostensive emissary of Christ, mediating between his invisible presence and the visibility of the indices, the indicia resurrectionis, recalls the argument in the paraphrase on Luke that corporal signs serve to prepare their recipients to behold Christ spiritually. The axial position of the stone, cardinal placement of the seal and empty tomb, and pointing gestures of Christ and the angel, along with the latter's representative relation to Christ, correspond to the argument in the paraphrase on Mark that close observation of divinely dispensed spectacula, spectacles, was the principal means whereby the resurrection came to be known and verified. And if you're scratching your head saying, but he didn't mention the paraphrase of Mark, I didn't because I, was, I cut it from the paper. But I, I, but I left that line in because I wanted you to know that that's going on too. 
He not only talks about signs and indices and documents and evidentia, he also talks about spectacula. The prayerful gesture of the foremost woman exemplifies the argument and the paraphrase of Matthew that the, the two senses of fides, faith, and proof coalesce in the actus fidei, the act of faith engendered by solicitude for the argumenta resurrectionis, the documentary proofs of the resurrection. In these and other ways, Erasmus's paraphrases, like the glossa, provide an exegetical warrant for those features of Bruegel's resurrection that distinguish it so remarkably from pictorial convention. Bruegel fashioned an exegetical image of the resurrection exploring the process of mediated transmission by which this greatest of mysteries came to be known. Thank you. Yes.